Hi, and welcome to our digital event. My name is Uda Riggen, and I'm the CCO here at Blue Eye Robotics. I'm standing outside our office in beautiful Trondheim together with software engineer Andreas Wiggen. Hello. Today, we'll talk about how we've integrated the Waterlink DVL into the Blue Eye X3 platform, enabling the exciting new control modes, station keeping and auto altitude. During this event, we'll show you all about this sensor's benefits and different use cases. We have also invited Professor Martin Ludvigsen and Alexandre Kardeyak from NTNU to discuss why the DVL is an essential tool in the maritime underwater industry. Oliver from Waterlink is also joining and will teach us more about the development of the DVL. If you guys have any questions during the event, use the chat function and you'll get a reply from one of our engineers. We're thrilled that you're here and we hope you find a great value in it. Please enjoy the show. Introducing the latest Blue Eye X3 integration, the DVL A50 from Waterlinked. Taking the frictionless Blue Eye user experience to the next level. The DVL A50 is tightly integrated with both the software and hardware of the Blue Eye X3. The integration allows you to plug the DVL into an X3 guest port using the Blue Eye Smart Connector. The Blue Nux operating system will instantly recognize the DVL and automatically appear in the Blue Eye app with its available features. The Waterlinked DVL uses four sonar beams to measure the ROV's velocity, giving you precise estimates of the ROV's position and movement. With the DVL's compact size and form factor, the added drag is minimal. This means we're able to preserve the Blue Eye X3's great maneuverability and agility. Our integration of the high-performance DVL opens for simpler operations with the new control mode, station keeping, allowing hands-free position hold with the push of a button. The new mode simplifies your operation by keeping the ROV locked in one place using the seabed as a reference. This is especially useful in challenging environments where currents or other external forces are acting on the vehicle. Station keeping will greatly reduce the complexity of operating the ROV and allows you to focus on the task at hand. Be confident that you won't lose track of the ROV while you adjust the app settings, switch pilots, or take a short break. You can also drive the ROV to a new position, and once you let go of the sticks, the ROV will automatically lock to the new position seamlessly. The ROV will use less battery with station keeping as the control system will only use the exact required force to maintain the position. Our DVL integration gives the operator accurate position data directly in the Blue Eye app. In the settings menu, you'll find detailed navigation data and a map showing the ROV's live position. The DVL's operational altitude ranges from a maximum of 50 meters all the way down to 5 centimeters above the seabed. This makes the sensor ideal for ROV operations close to the seabed. The DVL also provides altitude measurements, which opens for a new control mode called Auto Altitude. This feature enables you to maintain a desired distance to the seabed while diving in areas with uneven terrain. The position track can easily be exported from the dive log and shared directly from your device. Open the file in Google Earth or any other GIS tool and get an intuitive overview of the inspection. The file also contains your selected geo-referenced images, allowing you to automatically display the images at the correct location on the map. 
This is especially useful when reporting an issue and also makes it easier to get back to the same location to resolve it. It's one thing to find a problem, it's another to get back to the same place to fix it. The BlueEye X3 with the DVL A50. Simplify your ROV operations. Learn more at BlueEyeRobotics.com. So now you're seeing the new DVL mounted on the Blue Eye X3 with its new features. I hope you enjoyed it. And now I thought we could have a small chat with the, the manufacturer of the DVL from Waterlinked. So today we have uh, Oliver with us. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, could you just start telling us a little bit about the history of, of Waterlinked? Yeah, so the history of Waterlink goes back to 2013 uh, when our founder of the company was uh, coming in touch with uh, some of the existing underwater acoustic equipment which is out in the industry. And, uh, and he saw that there is a lot of old technology in use here, mm. uh, very old actually. So, so he, and he, he, had a, he has a background from, from miniaturized electronics. So he wanted to see if it was possible to do underwater acoustics using modern miniaturized low power uh, components. Yeah. Uh, it turned out to be uh, possible uh, and uh, so Waterlink then spent four years in the lab uh, developing the, the core technology of uh, underwater communication. Mm. Uh, and then we launched uh, uh, our first products actually in San Diego in the US in 2017. And then you decided to make a DVL. Can you say like how? Why was that a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> well, the the DVL development came a little bit later. We we started that in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, and at that time we had already developed a, an acoustic modem. Uh, so we had kind of the the computer, the need, the necessary computer to to do to do uh, the main thing that, that the DVL does. Yeah. Uh, and then we actually had a, a student uh, coming by us, and he wanted to do a, his master uh, thesis on a, on a directional uh, transducer. And uh, the result of that uh, thesis was uh, so good uh, that we saw that hmm, we 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 are very close to having the needed hardware for a DVL. So, so we decided to, to, uh, to try it out, uh, see if we can make a DVL. So we took the, the modem uh, technology, mm. uh, expanded it from one channel to four, uh, and it turned out that we, we basically had what we needed. So uh, then the whole project turned into be a firmware software development. Okay. And uh, we launched in 2020. Yeah. So, so what's so special about your DVL? Because DVL is not a new thing, like uh, it's been around for Decades. <laughs> absolutely. No, absolutely. And uh, you know, uh, I have a, I have a DVL uh, right here, and uh, the the most special thing about it is is what you see. It, it is the physical size. Yeah. Uh, you know, there has been a revolution, which Blue Eye has been an important part of uh, of uh, making happen, is to make the the ROVs small. Mm. Uh, and you you cannot simply pair uh, an existing legacy DVL with the small new uh, modern drones and, and ROVs. So, oh. so we, we, we decided to make this uh, DVL uh, as so small that it can easily be fit onto the, to the new small RVs and, and, and underwater drones. Hmm. So the physical size is, the, is kind of the main thing here, yeah. but also you know, there are some, some critical other aspects. Uh, it has a very low price point, yeah. so it isn't a huge investment for a customer to add DVL functionality. And then obviously also for, for many of the use cases, it has a minimum blanking distance of only five centimeters. So you, mm. can, you, can, you can operate it all the way down to the seabed where you typically need uh, the function of uh, station keeping, for example, which the DVL will give you. Yeah, because you're usually really close to the bottom when you try to pick up something or exactly. you want to uh, monitor the... Inspect something or... Inspecting, yeah, yeah. something on the, on the sea bottom. Yeah, so and, and, and the, the, typical, the typical other DVLs out there, they, they stop working at, uh, at uh, 50 centimeters. And that's, mm. that's a lot, actually, when, <laughs> when, you are, when you are working cl close yeah, to the yeah, seabed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, how was this? Uh, wasn't it a great challenge to make it this small? Like, is it what's like the main factors? Uh, it was. <laughs> it was a very. It was a very big, uh, big challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, but of course, some of that uh, miniaturizing project came 
kind of by itself because we have all always uh, aimed to make small uh, products. So the, the modem that we have uh, is already miniaturized. The, the hardware, the electronics in there is already miniaturized. Mm. So we kind of took it from there. Uh, we developed on top of that. But of course, the whole mechanical solution here, uh, we have spent a lot of time uh, to, to kind of remove basically every millimeter. This mm. is a cell phone design internally. Uh, th there, isn't, there isn't any uh, space available uh, anymore. Yeah. Uh, so we have had uh, long debates on why we need that last millimeter. And if we have had a chance to remove it, mm. we, we, we took it out. So, so that ended up with a, with a DVL, which is by far the world's smallest. And, uh, and it makes it uh, pretty easy to implement and uh, to mount on any any drone or ROV out there. Mm. Yeah. So uh, as we saw in the product video, it's uh, obvious. Uh, one of the obvious use cases is to get uh, station keeping. Yeah. Uh, for an ROV. But do you have any other use cases like other vehicles or oh, know, divers or? Yeah. You know. Uh, this, this DVL also has a unique feature that it carries its, its own IMU. So, so it, it does dead reckoning positioning yeah. directly out of the DVL. There is a lot of DVLs that doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, simply by, by uh, mounting this DVL, you also have uh, underwater navigation mm -hmm. right out of the DVL. So the, so the DVL is used for, for divers, uh, you know, these dive boards where you have, a, you have a screen and you have a, you have a DVL on the bottom. Okay. Uh, typically military divers, yeah. they, they use the DVL to, to track uh, how far have they been swimming, yeah. where, where are you, how to find back to the, to the vessel where you draw, dropped into the water, etc. Nice. Uh, it's been used by, by uh, police authorities to, to document where they have searched. Mm. Uh, if if you're searching off a river for, for something, uh, it could be a dead body, etc. Then, yeah, then, yeah. then, then you need to know where you have been. Yes. And of course, one big market is also AUVs, autonomous vehicles, yeah. because autonomous vehicles they also really need to know where they are because there is no pilot. Mm. Uh, so the, a DVL has always been a critical component component of an AUV, yeah. and uh, the AUV industry has gone through the same same uh, kind of migration that, that you have been pushing with the, with the blue eye drone mm. is to go down in size. Mm. So uh, that has fit very well with our small, small DVL, which is now mounted on, on a bunch of AUVs out there. When you've been developing this sensor, hasn't it been uh, a challenge to, to uh, how do you benchmark the, the quality of the position estimate? Because you don't really know where you are in the water and so how can you tell what's What's the truth? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's a big challenge actually to to kind of document and to performance test your own underwater sensors because I mean th there isn't a there isn't a established uh, truth you know on, on underwater where, where you are. Mm. So uh, so we we are using several approaches actually. We have uh, first of all in internally uh, in our lab we have uh, big water tanks mm. and we have uh, robots uh, in the water tank which can move the DVL in a in a kind of a predefined pattern. Uh, which we know super accurately on where the robot has actually moved the DVL. Mm. And then we can match uh, the results from the robot and the DVL itself to yeah. see if what kind of deviance uh, is there. Yeah. Uh, but of course, this is in a very controlled environment, uh, so it's kind of not kind of very valid mm. uh, for, for a real use case. So when we test out in the ocean, we use a USV, an, a surface vehicle. Okay. And on that surface vehicle, we have mounted uh, RTK enabled the GPS systems, yeah. which are accurate down to a, a centimeter approximately. And then we have the, the DVL mounted on, on uh, underneath the mm. USV and we drive the USV in, in huge patterns. Mm. It can go for kilometers, you know, and then we match, we match the track log from the DVL with, with the track log from the GPS. Mm. And then you can really test uh, long term accuracy long-term uh, stability mm. and uh, yeah it, it gives you a, in our view a very very good uh, answer to how accurate uh, the DVL actually is. Yeah no, that's very clever. So um, earlier today you got the chance to, to test out our integration of yep. the water-linked DVL on the Blue Eye X3. Mm -hmm. how, how was it to, to use and uh, get started 
Yeah, I mean, uh, station keeping. yeah, it's uh, you know, station keeping is uh, is an amazing amazing feature, uh, mm -hmm. and and I think uh, you know, uh, your office is uh, is close to a river where there is real current in in that river. So having station keeping on on uh, on an, on a drone out in that river really shows you the the importance of it mm. of it because you can go out in the river and you can you can push the button on the on the control and 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 the RV is there mm. it it stays exactly where it's supposed to be so it's uh, now it's an amazing feature you also have the the DVL in front of you here and we see it has the mount yep. the blue eye mount yeah could you tell us how it's like Connected to the drone? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, your your uh, specific drone is uh, is is flat bottom, and uh, mm -hmm. there is no room on the bottom of the blue eye drone to kind of put a DVL inside. Yeah. So so uh, what you have done is that you have made this very clever clever mount where you can you can slide it in uh, off on and off the the, the drone, mm -hmm. uh, and you have this these legs which can also support the drone when it stands, and it it's also a, a protective uh, feature for. For the, I mean, the front end of, of the DVL itself. Mm. So it's it's a very clever way to do it uh, to to both be able to easily mount it and also to, to protect the DVL itself. Because I mean, when you have this five centimeter blanking distance, you you are kind of invited to go close to the seabed. Yeah. Uh, so having that protection is uh, is a very good idea. Mm. And what about the the connector in the other end? Yeah. I mean, this is something I haven't uh, I haven't seen any other manufacturer do this. Uh, do this. Mm. Uh, I think it's super clever. Uh, it's uh, I know you call it a, a smart connector. Yeah. That's uh, right. So inside here you have uh, you have a, a small computer basically telling uh, the drone what are you now connecting. Mm. So this connector, when you connect it, will tell the drone that you you now have a DVL, uh, and it will wake up the DVL features yes. of your software and in, in the drone and, uh, and everything. And of course also provide power and power and Ethernet. You know, and uh, because one thing is to, to be able to get the features from the DVL when you're out driving. Mm. Uh, but uh, we know and you know that a lot of uh, our joint customers, they want to go back to their offices and analyze what they have done. Mm. They want to be able to, to log their, their uh, their uh, work, they want to be able to, to compare their tracks with other tracks uh, from other days, maybe mm. other teams. So, so to be able to easily export mm. and to, to work with that export uh, uh, after your, your work is done for the day is a very, very nice feature and I think your customers will, will appreciate it. Mm. All right. Thank you for, uh, for coming in today, Oliver. Thank you again really for having me. Enjoyed the, this session? I did, thank you. Let's have a closer look at the hardware and software integration of this DVL. This is what it looks like on the X3. It's easily mounted underneath with this uh, bracket. We also added uh, a new foot in the front to give protection for the, for the sensor. And these legs in the back maintains its stability when standing upright. What's good about the water-linked DVL is its size, obviously. You see how well it fits with the, with the overall size of this vehicle. This is important for maintaining the, the hydrodynamic uh, features of the drone. You can also see the, the cable is just a simple cable going up to the guest port connector. With this Blue Eye Smart Connector, you just plug it in and the system knows that now a DVL is connected and can automatically give you new features such as station keeping and auto altitude. So when you have the DVL connected to the drone, all you have to do is to power it on and open the Blue Eye app. Once you get into the dive view, you will see a new digit in the lower left corner, which is uh, showing you the distance to the seafloor. This is what we call the altimeter. Once you have a reading there, you can always activate auto altitude by hitting the A button two times. That means you can maintain a distance of, let's say, two meters to the sea bottom, and you can follow a pipe 
from 10 meters depth and all the way to 20 or 40 meters as it gets uh, deeper and deeper. This is great for maintaining uh, uh, the same distance to the seabed to capturing more stable video or if you are using a multi-beam sonar you'll also get more stable uh, image on the sonar. And what's new now is that you can, uh, once you place the drone in the water, it will give you the option to click the B button twice and then you will activate the new function which is called station keeping. With station keeping the drone will maintain its position relative to the seafloor even though you have strong currents from any direction. You can also seamlessly move to a new location by just using the joysticks as normal and once you let go of the joysticks the station keeping will keep you at that exact position. Auto altitude is also possible to get by just uh, using a different sensor. This is the Blue Robotics uh, 1D pinger. So that's uh, basically an uh, echo sounder that uh, measures the distance to the seafloor. But it does not provide you with uh, velocity measurements such as the DVL. So this is a much uh, easier way to get the auto altitude feature, but uh, of course you won't get either position or dynamic positioning. We also have a, a new diagnostics screen. So if you click the top right corner, you will see a detailed view with the, the local position estimates and the, also the global position together with a small map that shows you the GPS position of your phone and also the drone. So you can see how these are uh, being plotted. In this view you can also reset the position if you want to move to another location or you could uh, reset the odometer which is uh, basically a tool that you can use to measure a distance on the seabed. So you want to go 10 meters from point A to point B or you want to measure the, the length of a pipe. You can always reset, reset this the counter and then you can uh, keep going. After you've done your inspection you can basically hit sync log files and then go to the dive tab and uh, select the, the correct dive. Here you'll see an option to edit the both headline and description and you can uh, easily hit the share button and create a KML or a KMZ file. These files can be easily shared to anyone by uh, email or send it to a Dropbox folder and uh, then you can continue working with this file on, on, on your computer. Let's uh, try to share this file to uh, my laptop. Now the file is generated. I hit the share airdrop to my laptop. And let's see. Yeah, it's already here. So all I have to do now is open downloads, double click the file, and by default it uh, opens in Google Earth. And now you see this <laughs> dramatic zoom in to the location. And we can easily navigate in this world. I get a good overview of the inspection. So this is a pipe inspection from, uh, from the cleaning facilities of the municipality. You can see that we're taking some pictures going from the shallow and deeper and deeper. So here it's at 12 meters depth. And then we can take the, the end of the pipe which is at 23 meters. You also get info such as the altitude and the date that it was recorded 
and if you had other sensors that could also be on the overlay. So what's great about this is that it's really easy to see where the different findings were on, on uh, where they are located on, on the object. And it's also super easy to send this file to another program or maybe you have a more um, sophisticated uh, GIS tool that uh, is used to coordinate different uh, projects. For instance, in search and rescue, it's important to know which areas that have been covered, and maybe there are many different parties that are trying to, to work together, and then it's uh, important to know how you can stitch these uh, tracks together. All right, I hope you liked this overview of the integration both hardware and software of the new DVL with station keeping and auto altitude, also the position data. I hope you got some new ideas on how you could use this in your day-to-day -day work. Thanks for watching. We are now here inside the, the Blue Eye office uh, together with uh, two uh, guests. We have uh, Martin Ludvigsen who's a professor at uh, NTNU. He is at the Department of Marine Technology. We also have uh, Alexandre Cardiac with us from uh, France. He's doing his uh, PhD at the same department. Uh, so Martin, could you, with your uh, long experience with underwater sensors, uh, and technology in general. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, a DVL? What is this sensor and how does it actually work? Yeah, I can do that. The DVL is a Doppler velocity log. That means that it changes the, or it measures the speed of the vehicle. Uh, and one of the main challenges for all underwater operation is to know where you are and when you're there. It doesn't matter really if you find something interesting, if you don't know where it was. Uh, and one instrument that we can use to, to figure out where we were was the Doppler velocity log by measuring the speed, how fast we're going. When we know how fast we're going, then we can calculate where we were. And the Doppler velocity log uses sound to calculate the speed. Uh, more technically, it measures the changes of frequency as a function of velocity. If you recall an ambulance or a, a fire truck, you can uh, quite often notice that it changes its tone, whether it's approaching you or going away. Yeah. This is the same thing. Yeah, that's the same thing that the tone changes when the speed changes and the direction changes. Mm. This is happening within this instrument <clears throat> and we're able to detect it. And by, by doing that, we can measure our, our own or the vehicle's velocity quite accurate. Why is it uh, so important to measure the velocity? You have IMUs, don't you? And, uh... You can just uh, integrate that and get the position? or Yeah, we, we can measure both the position itself and the velocity and the acceleration. They, they all have their own strengths. Uh, so if we started with the, the, um, the acceleration, uh, to, to get the position of an acceleration measurement, you will need to integrate it twice. And all measurements we do have some component of error within it. Yeah. And an, uh, within an acceleration measurement, you will also have an error. And you will integrate also this error contribution twice, which is make your resulting position estimate drift over time, meaning that, that your, your position will be less and less accurate as time flies. Mm. Whereas for the DVL, you will only integrate once. That means that also for the DVL or position that is made from velocity measurement, also for for, the, for this position estimate, you will have a drift over time, but it will be less pronounced than, than for a acceleration derived position estimate. It's common to also use the DVL in combination with the acoustic positioning system. Yeah. Um, what, what's the strengths of uh, the DVL versus the, the global positioning system? Yeah, if we start with, with the latter one, the, the global positioning system uh, that is based on radio frequency. And unfortunately, they don't work underwater. So, so the, 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 the GPS doesn't give any value underwater, it yeah. doesn't work. 
but there are other systems that can measure our position by, by sending a sound and we can measure the time of flight for the signal that will can give us a range and we can calculate the position from one or several ranges. And then it's like a triangulation between transponders or? Yeah, there are differences. You can do triangulation between points or you can have like an advanced receiver that can detect the direction. So you can have both direction uh, and range and get the position from that. Yeah, the USB-L system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember you've been with uh, following us for uh, since the very beginning and one of the first sensors we you made sure we got into this company was a uh, quite big <laughs> DVL. It was about this size maybe. So and that's that was in 2015. Could you say something about what has happened in this area in terms of uh, both size and price point? Yeah, I can. Uh, DVL, <clears throat> because it's such an important sensor, they have been there, um, they've been around for a very long time and they used to be quite expensive systems and they're quite advanced systems because there's the signal processing to make this possible is um, it's not always trivial. Mm. But over the last year, uh, there has been, we have got uh, systems available that are super small compared to what they used to be, uh, just a small fraction of what they used to be, uh, because I think the improvement of electronic processing, uh, electronic components and cost of electronic components have made them much smaller. I think mm. also the market has become a lot, much larger, so they can produce it much more efficiently than uh, what was the case uh, five years ago when I brought in this this uh, large piece of equipment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was like yeah. half the size of the vehicle we were <laughs> supposed yeah. to make. So you also uh, introduced us to a, a EU, EU project called uh, Bugride Two. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, the project? The EU project is uh, it's funded by EU to stimulate uh, innovation and research within companies in Europe. And we're part of a consortia that wants to develop robotics to, uh, to develop solutions for inspections of ship hull and man-made structures, both in the air and underwater. So in this project, we have underwater drones, we have magnetic crawlers that can uh, drive around on the hull, so to say, and yeah. also aerial vehicle. Also part of this project is uh, interpretation, sort of to understand what we see. Um, <clears throat> but the, the end goal is to, to have more efficient or robotic solutions to be able to say what's the status or, or what's the condition of a ship hull or, or, or a, a boat to, to make them safer and to also make maintenance um, cheaper and, and better. So is this for uh, monitoring fouling or is it uh, more like the, the, the classing and the, the annual or is it every five years you have to do like a more thorough yeah. uh, inspection on the ship? Yeah, we, we, part of the project is also class companies to do class inspections. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's both uh, this planned um, cl class inspections but also more ad hoc inspections if something has happened or if the ship owner wants to see what's the status of his vessel independent of these uh, scheduled inspections. Mm. In this project, uh, we also uh, got the, the chance to get to know Alexandre. You are doing a PhD within the Bugride 2 project yep. and uh, using the, the Blue Eye drone with uh, tons of sensors. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm doing this PhD as part of the Bugred project. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my part is focusing on the underwater part uh, using a blue eye ROV. And so my objective is to perform autonomous robotic inspection of the ship hull, of the submerged part of the, of the ship hull. Mm -hmm. And for this, I need to make sure the drone is moving in a correct way around the hull to enable visual documentation but, and then uh, visual inspection of the ship. So you have like a, a planned path to follow or is it doing this automatically or yeah, there how is, do you tackle the, the ship hull? There is, uh, according to the parts of the ship hull, there are uh, inspection patterns uh, for the side of the ship hulls, mm -hmm. which are um, often known as uh, lawnmower patterns. But then when it comes to um, inspecting the propellers, 
it's more complex patterns uh, that need to be generated uh, based on each ship holds. Yeah. Uh, so for that part, it's a bit more complex. Yeah. So could you can we get the X3 in uh, in here, and so you could uh, present the different sensors you have chosen? So um, in addition to the sensors that I that are available by default with the Blue Eye drones. So the IMUs, pressure sensor, and the, and the camera. Uh, with the X3 and through the guest parts, I am using uh, first the USB-L, C-Track USB-L. Yeah. Um, then That's the global positioning system, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah to have uh, an yeah, underwater GPS. A non-drifting yeah. position. Um, then we have the DVL, Waterlink DVL A50. Yeah. And then, uh, a forward-looking sonar, multi-beam sonar, the uh, Oculus from uh, C-Track also. Yeah. And so with these three sensors, I'm able to have accurate positioning and uh, control the drone. Very cool. And it's, it's uh, really cool to see how you managed to get uh, all these uh, advanced sensors onto our small X3. And, uh, for those who, who knows these, uh, the details of the sensors, you see the, the DVL is one of the really first prototypes. So oh, yeah. you, were, you were really early on, on uh, getting the DVL attached to the drone. That's true, yeah. Uh, it's, it's been uh, cool to see how you managed to, to work with it uh, at such an early stage. What was so special about uh, the water-linked uh, DVL? Well, I think it has uh, multiple advantages. Mm -hmm. Uh, it provides relevant data in addition to uh, stable data mm -hmm. because through the API that Waterlink provides, uh, in addition to the velocity measurements, we have access to attitude and positioning, yeah. um, which is uh, useful to use as another source of information mm. to compare with the other sensors. But also, um, what is really uh, relevant with this sensor is that it is very small and light, so it's yeah. very easy to add it to the drone without physically impacting it. Yeah, so like the drag and uh, the maneuverability and yeah. it so still feels good to, to drive. That's true. And so for this reason, it makes this uh, sensor a really relevant uh, sensor. Yeah. Could you say something about the performance? Like how has it been uh, the, the actual uh, sensor performance? Yeah, so uh, based on the experiments uh, I've uh, experienced, it's um, very uh, effective as some sort, uh, at least in the horizontal plane, so X and Y axis. Yeah, so uh, yeah, in the flat. Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, however, for the third axis, so uh, with the axis along the depth, mm. um, it has some uh, troubles sometimes. But this is due to the tilt of the DVL, okay. uh, which can change because of the orientation of the drone, where it's uh, moving. Yeah. But also, there could be a mounting offsets, and this impacts uh, the, the, the sort of measurements in this third axis of the DVL. Yeah. But uh, fortunately, it can be compensated with the pressure sensors that, are, that is available in the, in the drone. And there's also this uh, altimeter. Have you? done any integration with that or um i i'll just altimeter use it to... is to to measure the the average distance to to the sea bottom right yeah but um i've just used it to just measure like the as you as you said the distance to the sea bottom but just to see globally where i am to, uh, compared to the sea bottom to make sure that i'm not too close to it okay but i'm not really using it for the solution, for simple inspection. But yeah, overall, I think the accuracy of the DVL is really good, yeah. Have you tested it at the different depths? Uh, so do you see like a significant change when it's uh, 40 meters to the bottom versus... Well, uh, there is uh, for sure a change in the uh, update rate. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, of course, a bit faster if I'm more close to the, to the seabed. Because mm, the sound doesn't have to go as far be before it comes back, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. But um, that's the main difference. 
I would say. But uh, it also a lot depends on the sort of shape of the ground uh, that can impact the the bottom lock feature okay. of the of the sensor and also the accuracy. So, uh, have you experienced like any particular areas or environment that is more challenging for the sensor than others? Or yeah, when there are a lot of sort of obstacles on the on the ground. On the, seabed, on the seabed, and if this is, for example, a bit uh, steep, yeah. uh, there is uh, the estimates from the DVL is are less accurate. But also, there is uh, something available with the uh, watering DVL that they provide information about if they consider the measurement to be valid or not, yeah. which is extremely useful in some cases, mm. so that you can just uh, disregard these measurements. Yeah. To not bias your model. How about you, Martin? Have you any experience from areas or like the, this is the classic uh, yeah. setting that or environment that's difficult for DVLs in general? Yeah, as, as we see, it's based on four acoustic beams that have slightly different direction, <clears throat> um, and what we really measure is the, the velocity along these directions, and then this is re reprojected into the XYZ. Yeah. And, and if we have really steep terrain and one of these beams are missing the seabed, it's not really hitting any seabed, you, you don't yes. get any good um, reflections out in, in one or two or three of these beams, th then the solution will be reduced. Yeah. So, so if, if it's steep, for example, then it, it, it's a likely that one or two beams will not hit the seabed and then we don't really get a good measurement. Have you ever considered uh, testing with like a tilting uh, DVL or something? Yes, actually we have done that at okay. Antenu. We <laughs> had the DVL pointing forward yeah. and then we had the ROV uh, navigating relative to a um, vertical rock wall. Yeah. Of course, then we need to point the ROV with the DVL into the rock wall uh, all the time. <clears throat> yeah. But that worked quite well actually. Mm. Uh, and also some other DVLs are also able to give you a velocity relative to the seawater because there will always be uh, particles in the seawater that can give some uh, signal uh, refracted back that you can also analyze. Yeah. Then you'll have so the water lock uh, in, in, uh, as opposed to the bottom lock. Yeah. Uh, this will be a lot less accurate, but if that's the only thing you have, it, it will give you good help. Mm. I actually had a similar experience uh, at the fish farm last week because we we went out to Stockia and did a test with the DVL and uh, I was very curious to see if the DVL would uh, recognize the the bottom of the fish pen at all or if it would just shoot through it mm -hmm. and actually it turned out to be working great as we approached it with the maybe eight to six meters, it uh, recognized the, the, the net as uh, the sea bottom and it could lock onto, onto the net. And once you got closer to the net, like less than half a meter, then it uh, went through the net and saw the, the bottom underneath it. So uh, dynamically it could switch between seeing yeah. the sea floor and the, and the net. And that was a great result because that means you could still use the DVL even though it's uh, more than 50 meters uh, yeah. underneath it. Yeah. You haven't really had the chance to, to test uh, our integration of the like the finished blue eye integration of the DVL yet, but I showed you a, a video right before this uh, interview. And what do you, how do you think uh, the user interface uh, looks? From my point, I, I think this is a classic blue eye style that we make things um, user friendly and, and easy to do to work with, um, and that we're able to to take in, to <clears throat> take into account the, the sort of theoretical results and, and and use them in a way that that is easy to use for everyone. So so and and I think it's quite impressive actually. That's what we're always trying to do: take the the difficult. Uh tasks and uh, sensors that uh, might sound very technical and make them super user-friendly and similar to, to what we're used to with flying drones that you can you could basically pick up any flying drone and uh, get it up in the air and let go of the sticks and it just stays there. So now with the DVL we can also do that uh, underwater if we see the seabed.
Thank you very much for coming, both of you. Pleasure having you. Thanks. Hi again. So now we're at the end of this digital event. We have certainly had a great time producing this and we hope you've enjoyed it. The same folks who help design and build our drone are available to answer your questions. So please shoot any questions using the chat function. But before ending, I want to say thanks to Professor Ludvigsen and Alexandre. We really appreciate your input. Thanks to Oliver for showing us how the DVL was developed and Andreas for teaching us how the integration is actually working with the Blue Eye ROV. But most importantly, thanks to all of you for attending today and taking time out of your busy schedule to learn more about Blue Eye and what we can do for your business. We'll be in touch with you very soon with some follow-up information. And again, if you have questions, please get in touch with us. We'll hang around in the chat for a while and you can always reach us by emailing sales at blueeye.no. See you around.